Good morning. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Welcome to our Easter service, uh, Zion's Easter service. It's the digital church now, you know, and it's kind of uh, been kind of fun for us, and yet it's been somewhat difficult and try to be creative about how we're getting the message out out to everybody. So once again, we want to welcome everybody who's listening. We know that Cieltel, um you guys are uh, trying to get it out for us, and uh, we're using it on Facebook and YouTube, and of course, we're, we're streaming it on our website. And we know there's people from um, Florida, and they're from um, North Dakota. We even have people in North Dakota, uh, Minnesota, and of course, Florida. So Florida and Arizona is, uh, I know we have large groups of people. I want to say thank you, and I want to say uh, we appreciate, you know, that all that you're doing during this time. It's been a, it's been somewhat of a struggle and uh, trying to reach everybody, but we've been going out and doing communion with people and and trying to uh, uh, go grocery shopping for some of you out there. And we've even put yard signs in your yard that uh, say uh, God's got it. And that's because this whole uh, COVID-19 um, is not not sneaking by God. He's got it and he'll take care of us. So we're going to figure that all, all that needs to be done uh, with that um, soon. So I want to get, uh, get going on, our, on the message today. Um, and I want to start off with the title is called A Skeptic Surprise. My mom, she always said, as long as you live in this house, you will go to church. Well, as a young boy, I felt dragged into church. And then as a college student, I still felt dragged into church. And then when I turned 19, I told my mom, that's it. I was in that rebellious time. And I said, that's it, mom, I'm moving out. I'm tired of being forced to go to church, guilted to go to church. So I packed up my bags, loaded up my truck, and moved to Beverly, so to speak. I moved out. But unfortunately, that meant that I had to do my own laundry. You know that hamper that you have at your house, that magic hamper? My mom, she kept it. She wouldn't let me take it. You know, the one you throw your stuff in, and then about two days later, it's all clean, folded, ironed, and put away for you? She kept it. And then the second thing was, I had to cook for myself. That's not a good thing, people. No teenager that has ever lived or probably ever will live has eaten more hot dogs, more Swanson's TV dinners, and those chicken pot pies than me. And that was the early 70s. And during that time, I considered myself a pretty open-minded individual. Pretty open-minded, but... When it came to religion, and especially Christianity, I was a skeptic. I was a hardcore, um, just a a doubting skeptic. In fact, one time I can remember, I was with my friend Grant, and we were walking down the streets over by the University of Minnesota in Dinkytown, and I wanted to check out some other faiths. I wanted to check out some other religions, and... As we were walking by this door, I saw a a sign pasted on it that said, um, Reverend Sun Mun Moon, meeting here today. I thought, great. So I said, come on, Grant, let's go in there. I started walking in, and he grabs me, actually by my afro. That's right, afro. Pulls me out by my afro, and he says, no, man, don't go in there. See, I had no idea that it was a religious cult. He yanked me out. He saved me from some, well, I should say another baffling experience. Now today I'm still curious about most things. My wife thinks I ask questions incessantly, just way too many questions. But I'm a skeptical when it comes to world religions. But at that time in the early 70s, I think I was more of a skeptic than an atheist, even though I may have said I was an atheist then. But my lack, in, my lack of belief in a God, in a real God, in the God of, of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, I, just didn't, I just didn't see it. I just, 
all my morals, all my values, they, they kind of crashed and, and tore because I used to think that it, was, it wasn't really real. I was looking for a way of, of uh, logic and reason to guide me, not a, not a spirit, some sort of a ghost. And I needed some logical explanation for life. I thought if there is no God, that means there's no heaven. And if there's no heaven, that means there's no hell. And if there's no hell, there's no judgment. And of course, if there's no judgment, there is no accountability. And if there's no accountability, well, then the most logical thing is to live like you want to. Live my life how I want to. And I lived it as a hedonist, somebody who seeks after pleasure. Everything I wanted, and that's what I did. And so I lived an immoral, drugged up, drunken, profane, self-absorbed, self-destructive life. And then when I was a freshman in college, my older brother Dan, he told me, I've decided to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, for a skeptic, a maybe atheist, or whatever I was, that had to have been the worst news I had ever heard. It was like my brother told me he had cancer. I thought for sure he was going to turn into one of those holy rollers. And he did. My brother Dan turned into it. Sure enough, he was an arm-raising, tongue-speaking, Bible-believing, church-going Christian. And he still is. But this was a major dilemma for me. You see, I'd always respected my brother. I'd always looked up to my brother. He was an all-national hockey player, an all-American hockey player. He should have known better. Better than getting involved in that that sort of crazy, simple-minded, religious hogwash. At first I thought, this guy's been brainwashed. But then a few months later, I started seeing some positive changes in his character and in his values. I mean, Danny was always a nice guy, but now he seemed different. He seemed like he was more caring, like he was kinder. He seemed to be happy and excited about this newfound relationship with with God, with Jesus. And I remember thinking, how in the world am I going to get him out of this cult? That's what I thought it was. And then, then one day we were shooting some hoops in the, in the driveway at our house. And Danny started talking to me about faith and religion. Now, he wasn't pushing it on me. He just told me his story. He told me his experience. Now, I grew up with him. I know. We went to church. Wasn't that enough? We went to the, to the youth group a lot. I mean, once a month, maybe. But he didn't push his religion on me. He just talked to me, shared it with me. And he said, Pat, you know, I really, really love hockey. And I really, really love um, going to college. But what I'm going to tell you about is different. He said, he told me that he'd lost that loving feeling that he had towards hockey. He said, I don't have that same love of the game. I love it, but not like I did. It had become my God. I put all my time, all my energy, all my effort into that thing. And then he told me that he even met with the coach, his college coach, said he wouldn't be playing hockey next year. And then he told me, It was just, hockey had just become too important. Well, I was in shock. And like I said, it was like he told me he had cancer. And I was hurt. The news hurt me. I was deeply hurt and shaken. And I remember sitting there as a skeptic, thinking, how could this have happened? Where's God, right? 
I mean, how could this have happened? And I left that conversation. And I continued, though, to live my life as I always had for myself. And then sometime after, one night I got a hold of some bad drugs. I had a bad trip. I hallucinated. And it scared me. And when I came awake, I remembered what my brother had told me. I started thinking about it. I thought about what my mom had talked to me about as I, grew, had, as I had grown up and my Sunday school teacher. I think my Sunday school teacher was one of the most important people in my life. Her name was Mrs. Pengra, Carol Pengra. I knew she cared about me. I just didn't know why she cared so much about me. And I knew that she loved Jesus, but I didn't know why she loved Jesus. At any rate, I was scared. That's not the kind of life I wanted to live. That's not how I saw myself. But I got wrapped up in drugs and alcohol and all the garbage. And so I, I turned to God in prayer and I said, help me God, I, I don't want to live like this. So if there really is a God, I want to know you, God, like my brother Danny knows you. I want you to help me like you helped Dan. I want the kind of joy I see in Dan and the confidence and the excitement. Lord, would you help me? Would you change my life? Get me out of what I'm into right now. And from that time on, I was on a journey to discover more about Jesus. And my life changed that evening. And then I knew that I needed and wanted to introduce my friends to Jesus. But like me, they knew of Jesus. They didn't know Jesus. They didn't take Jesus seriously. They didn't take what Jesus did seriously. So how in the world am I going to convince my friends that Jesus is who he says he is? So I, I, I knew what I needed to do. I knew that I needed to show them the bottom line. I didn't want them to go through what I just went through. So I wanted to share with them. And in order to convince my friends that Jesus is who he says he is, I only, I only needed to answer really one question. Did Jesus really return alive? Did Jesus come back from the dead? That's the ball game. That's the whole enchilada. Because time after time, Jesus made this outrageous, audacious claim that he was actually the son of the living God, the prophesied Messiah. In fact, at one point, Jesus, he got up in front of a whole group of Jews and he said, and it's recorded in John 10, 30, he says, the Father and I are one. The Father and I are one. Now for you uh, Greek geeks, those of you who really like the, the Greek language, the word therefore one, the Father and I are one, it's, it's not masculine, it's neuter. And uh, which means that Jesus was not saying the Father and I are the same person. What he said was the Father and I are the same thing. We're of the same essence. We're of the same nature. So when the people, the Jews, heard what Jesus had said, the audience, they went ballistic. They picked up stones. They wanted to kill him. They said, you're just a man, Jesus. And here you are, claiming to be God? Blasphemous. Okay, so what's the big deal? Right? If I claim to be Jesus, the Son of God, you, be, you claim to be Jesus, the Son of God, anybody could be, claim to be the, the uh, Son of God. Pastor Jason, he might say he claims to be the Son of God. Is it really that big of a deal? But I want to tell you what I found out. You see, but Jesus, he claims to be the son of God. And then he dies, right? So 
if Jesus claims to be the Son of God and then he dies, and then three days later he comes back alive, rises from the dead, I think that's pretty good evidence, don't you? That he's probably telling the truth. He might be the Son of God. And you see, and that's why I think the resurrection is considered to be the linchpin of the Christian faith. And that's why the Apostle Paul says this. Listen to this. It comes out of 1 Corinthians 15. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is a delusion. And you're still lost in your sins. In other words, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is everything. It's the whole ball game. And that's what I'm going to need to share with my friends. And that's what I'm going to share this morning with you. And I'm just going to highlight a few of the facts around the resurrection of Jesus. So you can understand why I think it's such a big deal, okay? So I'm going to do it by using the four E's, the letter E, for the, uh, t- talking about the resurrection. Four E's. Um, so if you're listening today, and you're not sure you're a follower of, of Jesus, maybe, maybe these four E's will really help you crystallize um, maybe some of the things that you weren't just so sure about. And for those of you who are followers of Jesus and you are people of faith, then I pray that, I'm going to pray that you will pray that somebody will come and talk to you and you can share these four E's with them. Okay. Oh, and by the way, I am... Um, going to make you a promise. I'm not going to use the Bible. Um, I'm not going to give it any more uh, credence, any more authenticity, um, the New Testament, than any other respectable literary expert would give to any ancient historical writings, like from Josephus or Tacitus or Suetonius. I'm going to apply all the equal scrutiny to these documents as I would to, to any documents, whether it be the Bible or those historical documents, to find out if they're telling the truth about the resurrection. So in other words, I'm not just going to open up the Bible and say, yep, Jesus resurrected. That's the end of the story. I'm not going to do that. Instead, we're going to dig a little bit, okay? Dig into these documents and, and show what happened. So here goes. What is the evidence that Jesus rose from the dead which will therefore prove that Jesus is who he says he is? What's the evidence? The first E stands for execution. You see, you got to have a death before you can have a resurrection. There's no dispute amongst scholars about the execution of Jesus Christ under Pontius Pilate. Nobody's arguing about it. It's, it's not disputed by anyone. Now, I'm not talking just about Christian scholars. I'm talking about all scholars, all scholars. Nobody's taking issue with this. You know why? Because when you study ancient history, we're lucky if we can get one or two sources to confirm a fact, okay? Because it's so, so uh, many years ago, thousands of years ago. And yet, at the execution of Jesus by crucifixion, by under Pontius Pilate's control, we not only have the New Testament, which are early first century accounts, but we also have five other ancient sources outside of the Bible confirming and corroborating with Jesus' execution. Okay? We have Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, and he worked for the Romans. Tacitus, another early historian. Lucian, who was a historian who really did, had disdain for Christians. Talus, he's the first century historian um, who wrote in Koine, Koine Greek. And then there's the, even the Jewish Talmud. Uh, admits that Jesus was executed under Pontius Pilate. So it's pretty well established. And you'd be laughed out of any real, true, major academic institution if you made a claim that Jesus was not executed that way and by Pontius Pilate. 
In fact, the evidence is so convincing that you could go to an atheist by a New Testament scholar by the name of Gerard or Garrett, excuse me, Ludeman. Garrett Ludeman of Vanderbilt University, and he'll tell you this about the evidence. He says, quote, Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. Indisputable. First of all, there's not that many things uh, that are indisputable when you're looking back at ancient history. But to hear, hear this kind of uh, uh, a comment from a critical, skeptical, atheist historian uh, that it was indisputable, well, that's, that's pretty, pretty amazing. So that's the first E. Jesus was dead. He was executed. Secondly, the second E for the word uh, is, uh, is early. Now this one's fascinating to me. Early. Because there are early accounts of reports that Jesus rose from the dead. Right away, immediately. Now this is important. Because you see, a lot of skeptics think that the resurrection was a legend. It didn't really happen, you know, kind of like the, the uh, uh, game telephone. Uh, he says somebody, she says some, something else, he adds to it, then she adds to it. A lot of skeptics think that, but for a legend to develop um, in the ancient world in particular, it would take 100, maybe 150 or 200 years in order for it to develop. See, first of all, the stories have to be invented and then it needs time for these mythologies to spin a little bit. Like, once upon a time, there was a man named Jesus. Oh, he was a great guy. Really? Oh, he's wonderful. Uh, he lived in the first century. Oh, he did, did he? Yeah, he healed the sick and he raised the dead. You gotta be kidding me. Yeah, but they executed him under Pontius Pilate. Really? Yes, but the third day, he rose from the dead. You gotta be kidding me. Really? But the fact is, it's not a legend. And it didn't take 100, 150, or 200 years. Early reports of the re resurrection absolutely decimate these claims that it was merely a legend. Now, stay with me on this. We have uh, preserved for us a creed. Um, a statement of conviction of the earliest church. The first, the first century Christians, they, they'd rally around this creed, which to the best of their knowledge was based on the facts that they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt to be true. And the creed summarizes the resurrection and uh, the essentials of Christianity. The Apostle Paul preserves it for us. He puts it in a letter to the church of Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, quote, I passed on to you what I received, which is of the greatest importance. Now, let me take a second here and tell you, this is a technical rabbinical language. Rabbis, teachers would use this kind of language when, when they would talk. And he's saying, this is a sacred language or a sacred tradition. This is a creed. It's important. I'm not even going to mess with it. I'm just going to turn and pass it on to you. I've got it and I'm going to pass it on to you. And then he repeats it in, this, in a letter. I'm going to read that letter to you. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. I passed on to you what I received, which is of the greatest importance, that Christ died for our sins, as written in the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised to life three days later, as was written in the scriptures. That he appeared to Peter and to all the twelve disciples. Then he appeared to more than 500 of his followers all at once, to whom are still alive, although some have died. Then he appeared to James and afterward to all the, uh, the apostles. All the apostles. And last of all, he appeared also to me. Paul's saying, if you don't believe us, there's still people living. Go talk to them. Go check it out. There's 500 witnesses. Some of them are still living. They're still around. You can still talk to them. But don't say it didn't happen. 
Don't go around telling people it didn't happen without checking it out. And then it goes on and he says, and then he appears to James. James was Jesus' brother. He was kind of like me. He was a skeptic. And yet James ends up being a martyr. He dies. He's executed as a, as a leader of the church. Something turned him around. What do you think changed him? What do you think changed James from a skeptic to a leader in the church? Well, I believe it was when the resurrected Jesus appeared to him. When James saw Jesus face to face, he believed. And then it says, and afterwards to all the apostles, last of all, appeared also to me. This report of the resurrection, naming eyewitnesses, groups of eyewitnesses, is really, really important. It's important to remember how immediately this developed after the death of Jesus. Because remember, legends, they take time to develop, right? A historian in this area, Dr. Gary Habermas, has developed this timeline to help us understand how early this creed was developed, okay? Let's take a look at it. We know historically, Paul wrote this letter uh, to, to the church in Corinth about 22 to 25 years after the death of Jesus. And Paul says he passed this creed earlier. He passed on this creed earlier. So in other words, he'd had it for a while, then he passed it on, all right? So the creed had been already around. So we're guessing probably 20 years after Jesus' death, at least, this thing had to have been around. So even if we just stopped here, the authenticity of what the resurrection is all about, pretty impressive, 20 years between the resurrection and the creed? You think about truth and reliability when you think about it. Think of the first two biographies of Alexander the Great by Arian and Plutarch. Um, they were written 400 years after his life. And Plutarch um, is considered uh, his writings very reliable. So 20 years or so is pretty impressive when you think of matching it up to a 400 year after um, writing. But we can go back even earlier than that. Paul, who used to be called Saul of Tarsus, he was a, he was a uh, persecutor of the church, a hater of Christians. One, maybe to three years after the death of Jesus, Paul is on the road to Damascus and boom, he has this encounter with the risen Christ, with Jesus himself, and he becomes then the Apostle Paul. And he immediately goes to Damascus and he meets with some of the apostles. And there are scholars today who believe that this is when um, he was given this creed. And he later writes, uh, that he later writes to the church in Corinth. But others say, no, it was probably three years later than that. Three years later, you see, Paul goes to Jerusalem and he meets for 15 days with two uh, people specifically named in the creed, Peter and James. Now, this is another Greek word here. The Greek word that Paul uses in Galatians 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 18, to describe the meeting is historia or historial. From Greek, it means inquiring. So they get together to inquire. It's to uh, investigate. They're basically saying they had a meeting not to talk about their favorite gladiator or chariot races or how about the weather, they're checking out, what do you know? How, do, how did you see Jesus? Tell me about your understanding. And they're both investigating back and forth. And most scholars think that this is when um, the, that he, Paul had received the creed. But either way, one to six years after Jesus' death, this creed is in, in existence. And therefore, the beliefs that this uh, creed was uh, somehow made up um, a long time 
after is, is not true. It probably goes back to the cross itself. So the point here is this. No huge time gap between the death of Jesus and all the beliefs and the convictions of this report that Jesus rose from the dead. We've got a news flash, church. We've got a news flash. And it goes right back to the very beginning, right back to the cross. He did resurrect from the dead. In fact, one of the greatest scholars in this area, James D.G. Dunn, writes this. This tradition, we can be entirely confident, was formulated as a creed, as tradition, within months after Jesus' death. Hear that? Months after his death. This is historical gold, people. This is good stuff. It would be unprecedented in history, the history of the world, for a legend to develop that fast and wipe out all the solid core of historical truth. In fact, one of the greatest historians that ever lived, his name is A.N. Sherwin White of Oxford. He studied the rate at which a legend developed in the ancient world. And he determined that it would take a passage of at least two generations of time. And that two generations even isn't enough time for a legend to grow up and wipe out the solid core of of historical truth. We don't have two generations of time passing here. Maybe we have a news flash and it goes right back to the beginning, as I said. And it's not the only early report we've got. We've also got reports right here from the first century. I've been using the other documents and I'm certainly going to use the Word of God. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. First century stuff. This stuff was circulating during the time of Jesus. After Jesus' death, people were talking about it. This isn't something that that uh, we're just making up. There were plenty of people at that time who had been very happy to, uh, to point out all the errors of this creed. They had been very happy to say, now that's a bunch of baloney. Horse hockey. People just made that up. So we've got an execution. Jesus was dead. We've got early reports of the resurrection so immediately you can't write them off. But we got more. We got more. The third E is, stands for empty. We have an empty tomb. We have an empty tomb. The historical records prove it. That tell us Jesus' body was placed in a tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Jewish council. That's a fact. That's a historical fact. And it was sealed. That's a historical fact. And Matthew says it was guarded. And yet, it was discovered empty on that first Easter morning. Now we could spend the rest of today and tomorrow kind of going through all the the strands of the historical evidence about that. That the evidence of the tomb was empty. But I'm only going to go to one fact. We'll just focus on one fact. And to me, this one fact is conclusive. And that is this. Even the enemies of Jesus admitted the tomb of Jesus was empty. He was gone. Because when the disciples proclaimed that that Jesus is written from the dead, the opponents said nothing. They never said, oh no, he's not. Oh, he's still in there. Or baloney. Go look in the tube. Find out for yourself. But they didn't say it. But that's all they would have needed to say. And everybody would have gone in there and said, no, he's still there. The rock would have been moved. He was gone. 
But they didn't say that. And we know from sources inside and outside of the New Testament that when the disciples began to to preach and proclaim Jesus has risen from the dead, the opponents of Jesus, you know what they said? Uh, um, Well, um, the disciples stole the body. Because that's what they were told. You can read about it in Matthew 28, verse 13. The guards were given money. They were bribed to tell people that. Think about it. What is it? Why would they say that? It's a cover story. That's why they're admitting the tomb is empty. They're trying to explain how it got empty. And they start blaming it on the disciples. They took the body of Jesus. Not our fault. See what I'm saying? It's like if you were a teacher and your student comes up to you and says, hey man, the the dog ate my homework. Okay, what the student is implying or admitting is, I don't have my homework. And then he explains that because the dog ate it. But he still is admitting he doesn't have the homework. That's the thing, same thing going on here. Implicitly or explicitly, the enemies of Jesus and all the supporters of Jesus are all saying and admitting the same thing. The tomb was empty. So how did it get empty? Well, let's go through uh, the usual list of suspects, shall we? The Romans weren't about to steal the body. They wanted Jesus dead. The religious leaders, they weren't about to steal the body. They wanted him to stay dead. And the disciples weren't about to steal the body. They were scared. They had no motive, no means, and no opportunity. So the best explanation of the tomb of Jesus being empty, in my opinion, is that Jesus rose from the dead. Especially now, when you combine it, with the fourth E, eyewitnesses. Not only was Jesus' tomb discovered empty, but over a period of time, Jesus started appearing alive. He appeared alive to more than 515 people. Jesus appears to skeptics, opponents, doubters, believers, Men, women, groups, individuals, indoors, outdoors, daytime, nighttime. People talked to Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They touched Jesus. Think about it. Remember when I said you'd be lucky in the ancient history world? As if you could get one or two sources that confirm a fact? Well, get that. Get this. For the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the resurrection of Jesus, we have no fewer than nine ancient sources inside and outside of the New Testament confirming and corroborating their beliefs that they had indeed, these disciples, these other people, had indeed encountered the risen Christ. Now that's an avalanche of historical data and it changed the disciples it changed the disciples from being cowards afraid that they were going to be persecuted and executed and history shows us that just a short time after Jesus showed himself to them that these once cowardly lions these once cowardly disciples are now boldly proclaiming that all the words that Jesus said he backed it up. He backed up his claim that he was indeed the son of God because he returned from the grave and he conquered death. And we have seen seven ancient sources out of that inside and outside of the New Testament that the men suffered. These disciples suffered. They were, some of them, tortured and hung upside down on the cross. But they paid a price for it. Their boldness. So why in the world Would they be willing to do that? How did they go from this cowardly lion to these bold people? Because they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt for a fact 
that Jesus had appeared right in person to them, alive. He was once dead and now he's alive. They saw the scars on his hands. They knew he was alive, that he'd risen from the dead. They saw him, they spoke to him, they ate with him. Jesus conquered death. After all the evidence, all the stuff we've talked about in the resurrection today, I think it takes far more faith for people to maintain their skepticism, their atheism, their agnosticism, than it is to give their life to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The Bible says in Romans 1, But to all who receive him, who believe in his name, that means who accepted Jesus into their heads, hearts, and minds, he gave the right to become children of God. When you ask for help, like I did, like my brother Danny did, like many who are watching right now have done, Jesus will come into your life immediately. He will come beside you. He will live within you to help you to heal you, to change your life so you can find that, that peace that passes understanding, that gives you some joy. Remember the stuff I was looking for my brother Danny? That's what we get when we have Christ in us. We find that peace. We find what we're looking for. And then something happens to our heart. Let me read it out of Ezekiel. Here's what God says. I will give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit within you. I will remove your, your heart of stone and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. So I invite you right now, wherever you are, to do what I did, do what my brother Danny did, to what a lot of people at Zion are doing and have done, to get on your knees and, and pour out your heart to God and ask Him to forgive you. Make confession to a holy God and invite Jesus, the risen Savior, to be your Lord the Lord of your life. And at the moment you do that, you will receive complete and total forgiveness. You'll be set free by the power and the grace of Jesus Christ. And then you'll become a a follower of Christ, a Christian, a child of God. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Let's rise for closing prayer. Heavenly Father, there's a lot of data for us to talk about, to think about, to discuss, to share. Lord, I pray that you'd use this message from the scriptures that'll move people's hearts. That they'll be excited about having a new life with you. Lord, I pray that that people will start understanding what they didn't understand. We don't know what we don't know. But if you didn't know, if the people here don't know, if you are listening, you don't know who Jesus is. You don't need to stay a skeptic. You just need to pray the prayer. You need to ask that Jesus would come into your heart and that your life would be transformed by his power. In Jesus' name, amen. So it's a happy Easter to you, and now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he look upon you with his favor and give each and every one of you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before we go, I do want to tell you one thing that next week we're going to start a new series. And it's going to be entitled, How God Meets Your Deepest Needs. And I think you're going to like it. It's going to be a longer series. We're going to talk about how God heals these wounds within you, how you find hope, how you learn to trust God when it hasn't been easy for you, how you're going to find peace in your pathway, how you're going to live a joy-filled life, So how do you trust in God? How do you learn to do that? And what kind of father is our heavenly father? And then finally, how to live a joy-filled life. Come and join us next week. Thank you everyone for joining us. God bless you and happy Easter.